Thank you, guys. <clears throat> well, my name is Bob, and I'm a grateful believer who sometimes still struggles with love, abandonment issues, low self-esteem, and sometimes anger. <laughs> However, as Fran says, I am getting much better. <laughs> been doing this for a long time and every year this is our 11th or 12th year actually we've been doing this for 11 years and uh, the Lord has really been very gracious to me and has really been working in my life and so I'm just very thankful for that well uh, tonight we have a special program and um, those of you who are who have your schedules you'll notice that there is a um, testimony tonight we have a guest speaker tonight from an, an adjoining church this is the uh, Cedar Boulevard Neighborhood Church in Newark. And they have been doing Celebrate Recovery there now for, what, three years, uh, Jeff? Three years. Three years. And this is, uh, was, was supposed to be a, a couple's testimony. Jeff and Lisa Matthews have agreed to come, graciously agreed to come and share their testimony with us tonight. However, unfortunately, Lisa could not make it. But Jeff is here. And so he's going to actually do both sides of the testimony. <laughs> That'll be interesting. <laughs> you can say whatever you want, I guess, on huh, Jeff. <laughs> and uh, Jeff is, uh, has his own business. Uh, it's, a, it's called a Matthews Mechanical. Apparently, they, do, um, uh, they make equipment and machinery for, for bit large businesses. And so he's been doing that for a long time as well. So without any further um, uh, discussion, let me introduce to you Jeff Matthews. Please come on up and give him a great welcome. Does that work? Oh, it does. This is the first time I've ever used a, uh, a boom mic like this. It's a lot easier than, than that. I'd like to open in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for putting this group of believers together and, and uh, having us all together to come before you and, and to be healed by you. I just pray that anything that comes out of my mouth tonight, if it's from you, that it would take root, and if it's from me, that it would blow away and burn up, that it would be gone. Father, it's all about you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. What an honor to be here tonight. My name's Jeff Matthews, and I'm a believer in Christ who is recovering from alcoholism, sexual addictions, and I'm still struggling with overeating. You know, as, you, as I talk tonight, you know, some of you may, have, may be able to identify with bits and pieces of my story. Some of you may identify with my whole story. What I really want to share specifically about is how Jesus has affected all of my relationships since coming to know him and getting sober. I've had discussions about whether alcoholism is a disease or a decision, and I don't believe that any of my comments tonight will make a definitive argument for either case. And frankly, I don't care. The answer doesn't change anything about what I have to do to live the life that God has set before me. I do know that I am unable to drink like a normal person, in quotes. And in fact, I have never been normal with, with regard to the use of alcohol. In fact, I am finding that I seem to be unable to do most things in a normal manner. If I like it, I seem to do it until it hurts before figuring out that I need to stop. I had my first drink of alcohol that I can remember somewhere around 10 years old. Not enough to get me really drunk, just enough to allow me to feel the buzz. I have to tell you, I liked it. As I was thinking about it, it came to me that even for that first time of drinking alcohol, I was able to overcome the taste to get to the effect and I didn't suffer any hangover the next day, which proved to be a pattern for my drinking career later on. I didn't partake of any other alcohol for another five or six years until I was about 16, you know, so I was really waited a long time before I drank again. And the funny part is that I didn't miss drinking that at that point, and it didn't consume my thoughts or run my life. I went through school with decent grades, took advanced classes, and was generally one of those kids that wasn't a problem to the adults and I was a square with regard to my peers and generally did what it took to get the, he's such a good boy, compliments 
and acknowledgments from the teachers and parents of my friends. We moved, my parents and I moved to Vancouver, Washington, and I started my ninth grade year. I was starting to desire to be one of the cool people that did the stuff like smoking and hanging out across from the school. In the field where all the cool kids hung out after school. I learned to smoke. Again, I was able to get through the dislike of the taste and coughing to obtain the cool factor. And at about this time, I also tried marijuana for the first time. And again, I overcame the coughing and taste to get to the effect. See, are you starting to see a pattern here? I got to spend some time with my cousin from my dad's side. He was about my age, a year or so older, and he had a sister that was two years older than him. They lived in Portland, Oregon, and I still remember that particular day that my drinking career got started. Really restarted is a better word for it. I don't know how many of you can remember your first time getting drunk, taking your first drug, having your first, first time having sex, or whatever it may be. But I can tell you almost everything about that Saturday afternoon when I became 10 feet tall and bulletproof. It was a fall day. It was kind of crisp. The beer was room temperature left over from a party that my cousin had attended the night before. <clears throat> it was Olympia beer, and it made me feel wonderful. I don't remember the taste, only the feeling. I was no longer embarrassed to be me. My looks didn't matter, and what you thought of me didn't matter either. We didn't get caught, no one got in trouble, and I didn't see any reason to not do this again. As I'm looking back with some years of sobriety in place, I can see where the disease had continued to progress during the years that I didn't drink. I picked up drinking like I had much experience at it, and I always wanted more. I didn't like the fact that when I smoked pot, I couldn't maintain my composure as easily when around my parents or teachers, so my drug use was limited. I did figure out how to water down my parents' liquor bottles and make suicide punch, a mix of everything in the liquor cabinet, which tasted nasty, but absolutely had the desired effect. I practiced how to be drunk and enjoy the buzz without letting teachers and parents know what was going on. As I went through high school, getting drunk and attending basketball games, dances, and other school functions became the normal Friday night activity. As a sophomore, I took a printing class at a local community college for one of my elective credits. And rather than ride the bus to class, I started riding with one of the other guys in the class. Uh, and we started drinking Old English malt liquor on the way to class. Boy, it made the class go quicker and made it way more interesting. Uh, I took my final exam in that class while I was hammered. By the way, I got an A on that test in spite of being drunk. During this, ta during this time, I did dabble in drugs and I actually started my own business, buying lids of pot for $7 an ounce and rolling joints for resale. So I learned the concept of supply and demand and how to make a profit carry forward into the next transactions, skills that I use to this very day in the business that my wife and I run. This is probably one of the most useful things I learned in school. I continued to drink at every opportunity from this point forward. I was constantly planning how to get alcohol and where the next party was gonna be. I practiced drinking and driving as I had to drive to where the parties were. And since I was sneaking out of the house most of the time, I had to make sure I got home and back in bed quietly each night. I practiced driving in a small town in Northern California late at night where the 10 o'clock curfew for minors, uh, driving into the town at 10 o'clock at night where there was a 10 o'clock curfew with one eye open because I was seeing too many options for lanes to drive in. And the cops used to hang out right behind the welcome to Fortuna sign just inside the city limits, waiting for speeders to come off the Highway 101 into town. So I had to be sure I straightened up and flew right as I passed them. This set the stage for my drinking and how I drank for the rest of my drinking career. 
I became the designated drunk driver as life went on. The reason for telling you about how it all started and what it was like is to show how easily alcoholism seems to start in those of us who are susceptible to the disease. At least I know it grabbed me from the very first time I drank. I know people that can drink heavily for an occasion and not have any thoughts about drinking again the next day. I can state unequivocally, that is not me. So let's fast forward to 1974 and I'm graduating high school and I'm working at a McDonald's restaurant. Since I was old enough to close, I worked on the closing crew on weekends and our routine was to have a drinking party at somebody's apartment every Friday and Saturday night after closing. Across the street was a Taco Bell, and since they closed later than us, and the girls working there had really short skirts as part of their uniforms, we started making friends with them and helping them to close up and get cleaned up so that we could invite them to our parties. I didn't know it at the time, but I was chatting up my future wife. By the way, Lisa looked absolutely hot in her uniform. She was the best of the bunch. But I, of course, was attracted to her wonderful personality and tender heart. Long and short, we got engaged to be married on July 4th, 1974. Got married December 7th of that same year. And we just celebrated 37 years of marriage in uh, in December. (laughs) 37 years all with the same people. I mean, you know... We moved to Los Angeles, where I was working as a hydraulic mechanic at a, at a, uh, a service co- We moved to Los Angeles, where I was working at a hydraulics company as a service mechanic. The other mechanics, at least the good ones, were all heavy drinkers, so I was able to jump right in and be one of the guys and learn many deep and important things during the drinking sessions after work. I was totally engaged in building my career and learning what it took to succeed with no regard for Lisa's desires or needs. This building my career theme became a driving desire and distraction in my relationship with Lisa for many years to come. Somehow during this time, we managed to have a son, move back to the Bay Area and buy a house, lose a child during pregnancy, and then have another son. During this time, I worked a ton of overtime and started drinking daily. I was physically and emotionally unavailable to my wife for the intimacy necessary to build a strong marriage and I was unavailable for my sons to give them a proper role model of what a father should be. As a follow-up note to this, Lisa and I have gone back and completed the grieving for Christopher Paul and are thankful that he is in God's hands. This has only been possible for me because of the relationship with God that has come out of my sobriety. My daily drinking progressed to drinking straight tequila as I thought it was easier to hide the drinking because I didn't have to drink as much volume to get the effect. Common theme in my drinking has always been the effect. I began to have consequences with my wife from my drinking and was losing the ability to control how drunk I would get when I drank. The times where I would get blasted and not be able to keep my commitments with my wife and family were getting to be a weekly event. I was trying the various ways to be able to continue to drink. They weren't working. My periods of not drinking were spent counting the time until I could drink again, and I was angry and resentful the whole time. I was doing everything that I thought a man was supposed to do and fully believed that I was responsible for myself and what was going to happen in my life. As far as I went, there was no God, and I sure didn't need one. I had control of my life, and if it was to be, it was up to me. You could believe in God if you needed to, but I didn't need that crutch. During this time, I started to understand that I was unable to control my drinking, and the self-loathing that came from being weak with regard to drinking was starting to show up every day. I would wake up and think, I'm not going to drink today. And at the end of the day, I would find myself pulling into the liquor store parking lot, cussing myself out, in my head anyway, hating myself all the way up to when the first swig of tequila would go down my throat. Then the self-talk would stop, and all was okay till tomorrow. In our 20th year of marriage, Lisa and I were pretty much toast as far as the marriage went. She was doing everything she could to get me to quit drinking, and I wasn't going to let her control me. 
I was willing to let her leave if that, if that was what she needed to do, but I wasn't going to let her control me. I knew in the back of my mind that at some point I would be a non-drinker. I just didn't know when or why, and just importantly, just as importantly, I didn't know what kind of a person I would be when I got sober. So I screwed up again, got too drunk, and when I was, able, was unable to do something I was supposed to do, I don't remember what that was, and I made a rash promise to Lisa that I would attend an AA meeting. On the day I was to attend my first meeting, at the end of the day, I went ahead and drank my daily dose of tequila and called Lisa to tell her that I had too much paperwork to get, that, uh, to get done and that I would go to that meeting tomorrow. For you married men, I suspect that God talks to you pretty frequently, and whether you know it or not, know it or not, he sounds a lot like your wife. I know that that was the case for me, and it is, that is the case for me and James Dobson. She asked me, why wasn't I being a man of honor and doing what I said I would do? Somehow, and I know now that it was God, those words hit my nerves, and I went to a later meeting that night. Of course, attending the meeting drunk, I had nothing in common with those losers in that room. So at the end of the meeting, I stopped at the liquor store on my way home. I got a couple of additional bottles of tequila, little mini bottles, for that long three-mile drive home. I got home, and I was laying in bed with Lisa, telling her how this AA thing really wasn't going to for me, and it probably wouldn't work. But for her, I would go to another meeting. As Lisa and I have compared notes later on, I found out that it was at that time, while we were laying there in bed, when I said those words to her, she, in her head and in her heart, gave up on me. And she told God he was going to have to deal with me. She couldn't do it. What I experienced was a feeling of total hopelessness and despair, unlike anything I had ever experienced which caused a pain in the middle of my chest and brought me to uncontrollable tears and crying for the next 30 to 40 minutes. This was totally unlike me. I hadn't cried in the 20 years of our marriage and probably not for many years before the marriage. After all, real men don't cry, right? What I know today was that God was using that time to show me the God-sized hole in my soul and preparing me to start seeking relationship with him. What ended up happening was that I started attending AA meetings sober on October 11th, which was the next day, 1994, and I have not had to take a drink or a recreational drug since that day. My wife took me to see an elder at her church, and he convinced me that there might be a God, and that if I would ask him, he would help me stay sober and grow in relationship with him. So as I asked for God to help me in the next few days at the points where I had a decision to make regarding either stopping to get a drink or passing by the liquor store and going home and staying sober, I was able to go home sober and not have the resentments and anger that I used to have. His response to my simple request started me to believe in him and to actively seek relationship with him. That led me to start attending church to increase the spiritual aspect of my recovery. AA taught me to get in service, so I became involved with the church, which helped me to grow closer to God and eventually Jesus Christ, my Savior. The verse that grabbed me early in sobriety is Joshua 24:15, which tells me that I get to choose who I'm going to follow today. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. It's Joshua 24, 15. God was very gentle and very faithful with me in early sobriety, giving me a tingle up my back when I would ask him for help, just to let me know he was there and removing the anger that would have been seething under the surface for so many years. I had not realize, realized just how permanently pissed off I was for so many years. It just seemed like everyone was out to mess up my plans and I didn't like it. A saying that I heard in AA, usually just before laughing at someone who was mad about what something they had thought was mad about, 
something that they had thought they were mistreated about was, don't you know who I am? I found myself asking, I found myself asking myself this question as I was driving, and people weren't driving the way I would have them drive, or they had the nerve to cut in front of me to get on the freeway, or worse yet, they didn't alternate when merging onto the freeway, you know, sometimes going two cars at a time. The difference was I was able to start laughing at myself more than I was ever able to in the past because God was giving me a new identity, one that was no longer based on anyone else knowing who I was, only that I know who I was in the eyes of the only one that matters, God. Here's how my fights with Lisa usually went. I would make some stupid comment about something she either did or didn't do. After all, didn't she know who she was dealing with? She would respond in a defensive manner, and the battle was on. It now became my duty to win this battle at any cost. I might even know that I was wrong, and I was still determined to say that whatever it took to win, her feelings or emotions were of no concern. When I got into sobriety and started seeking a higher power, God, what ended up happening at those arguments was that while they would start the same, I wouldn't keep up the fight like I used to. Instead, I would cut and run to a meeting where I would find some peace and serenity with God. I would return home in an hour or two and be in a place to offer an apology or an amends and ask for forgiveness for not treating her with the respect and love that God was showing me she was supposed to get from me. I didn't use exactly those words, but the sentiment was there. You can imagine the positive change that had on Lisa's and my relationship in a pretty short time. An example of how God was working on me was one time driving from a job site in a 35 mile an hour residential area. I was following some lady who was only driving 35. Imagine that, she was only driving the speed limit and I was driving 50 so that I could make the light at the corner. Of course, I was stuck behind her at the light that we didn't make. So I was ranting and raving about her her driving skills, habits, and any other character de defect I could think of. In fact, I think I was reciting her genealogy when God chose to reveal himself to me again. I heard a voice, just like someone was sitting in the empty passenger seat, tell me that I had no right to talk about one of God's kids that way. The voice was neither angry nor even loud, but it spoke with total authority. I felt the anger just drain out of me, and tears of gratitude started flowing. As I knew where this came from, and I was grateful for the rebuke. <clears throat> All this time in early sobriety, my relationship was with God. Me and God, you know, we're hooked up. I don't need this Jesus guy getting in the way of my relationship with God. It wasn't until about two years of sobriety when I started to deal with the Jesus issue. It wasn't because of any particular crisis but because he kept popping up and needing to be addressed in my spiritual life. He just wouldn't go away. I attended a week-long retreat that was focused on breaking through the strongholds that hinder our relationship with Jesus. And I must say, this was the most frustrating, draining week that I could remember for a long time. I just didn't get it. Everyone else was getting it, but I just couldn't understand how Jesus and God could love me with some of the things I had done and was still doing. My porn addiction had started back up by this time, and it wasn't until the evening before we were scheduled to leave that Jesus was able to get through the debris in my head and help me to know who he is. I didn't fully realize how big that would be in my life and relationships until Monday morning when I was telling Lisa about my experiences at the retreat and I found myself in tears and unable to speak when I started to tell her about what Jesus meant to me and how he fit into the salvation picture for me. That is when my faith became rock solid and unshakable. I don't claim to understand why God would do what he did for a jerk like me, but I know with every fiber of my being that he did it and there's no turning back for me. I may wander in the desert sometimes, but he is faithful to lead me out as soon as I start following his directions. Somewhere in my second or third year of sobriety, it came to light that our oldest son was using drugs and there were other issues going on. <clears throat> my reaction was to seek God for what to do. That was the right decision. 
My next one wasn't quite as right. Instead of staying tuned to what God wanted to do, Lisa and I did what we always did. We fixed him. And we fixed him. And we fixed him. And we fixed him. And so on. The problem was that he kept breaking. Or at least that's what we thought. What we finally figured out was that we kept getting in the way of what God wanted to do in our son. So we took the discipline that was meant for him. So we were stopping God from doing the work he desired to do in our son. We finally got the message and made the hard steps. Fired him from my business twice. Had him move out, in and out of the house a few times. And then finally telling him he was no longer allowed to live at our house. I physically locked him out of the house when the deadline came and he hadn't taken his stuff. We were prepared for him to be homeless and sleeping under a bridge if that was what it would take for God to do his work. Didn't get to that point, but our son wore out his welcome at almost all of his relatives and family before getting into recovery and finding a God in his life. Approximately eight years ago, someone told Lisa and me about a program called Celebrate Recovery that was based on the 12 steps of AA, with the difference being that the higher power is clearly defined as Jesus Christ, our Savior. We attended an introductory seminar, the one-day seminar that they, like they just had in Sacramento this last weekend, came away from that day totally on fire for the program and wanting to see it happen in our spheres of influence. The recovery that was available for not only the alcoholic and the Al-Anon, but the other people that have been hurt or have life-destroying habits was totally attractive to us. We met with some others who had attended the training, and we decided to start a CR at our church. Before starting our meeting, we attended several other existing meetings in the area to see how well it worked, and we were constantly blown away by the recovery we found in each of these places, places like this. So we started a step study at our church. And we started attending a Friday night meeting at Harbor Light Church in Fremont. You know, I've gone through the CR steps about four times now, and each time I'm finding new things, deeper, new things and deeper issues that I'm, I'm working on recovery from. You may have noticed that I claimed recovery from sexual addiction at the beginning of this share. It has only been in the last year or so that it was made clear to me that I had some issues from the past that needed to be brought to light and given away to Jesus so that I can be totally free from any bondage in that area. I must tell you that the process of consciously surrendering these past sins to Jesus has been tremendously freeing to me. It confirms to me what was written in John 8, 34 through 36, where Jesus says, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in a family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I am finding that as I am set free from past sins and the desire to continue in sin today, that I'm able to open up to my wife in a manner that that I've never been able to in the past. And I'm able to carry the good news to those around me in ways that I would have never believed possible with grace and mercy. I am active at Celebrate Recovery meetings and activities, sponsoring some men and maintaining a relationship with my sponsor. As a side note to that, you know, I actually, I wrote this testimony probably two years ago, and I didn't update it for tonight because it was last minute. But in the last probably eight months or so, I I, uh, broke away from my sponsor. You know, things were going okay, and uh, there was no real big issues that we needed to deal with, and, you know, ran into him every now and again, but really wasn't meeting with him on an ongoing basis. And what I found was that as I neglected to attend to my sobriety, as I uh, uh, neglected to attend to my recovery, um, I start running out of steam. You know, I, I sponsor a couple of guys, and, and it doesn't take too long, and, and I don't have anything to offer. So, you know, I've started meeting with my sponsor again, and, and I like it. I like it. The funny part is that I always get something from every meeting I attend. I actually attended a, accidentally attended a small group meeting for men with same-sex attractions. I wasn't sure what I was going to get from that meeting, as this has never been one of my issues. However, I came away from that meeting with a clear understanding that while the issues may be different, the feelings, behaviors, and emotions associated with the hurt, habit, or hang-up are all the same. 
The attenders at that meeting had similar reactions to what I have, and their solutions applied to me also. Because I'm active in CR, I get to participate in the recovery of those around me and see Jesus work in their lives in very obvious ways. You know, my wife and I are ministry leaders, co-leaders at, at our Celebrate Recovery in, in Newark. And uh, what's kind of fun is, you know, in our, in our business, I'm the president, so I get to have the final say, and we have discussions, of course, but when push comes to shove, I get to have the final say. In Celebrate Recovery, we've reversed the roles, and, and she's really the ministry leader, and I'm a co-leader, and so when, when push comes to shove, she gets to, she gets to make the decision, and it's good for both of us. You know, it's good for me to, to make sure that I'm not being a bully and just having it always my way all the time, and it's good for her to, to have the, the, uh, the leadership and, and, and be able to, to walk through that whole process. I invite each of you to get involved and stay involved in your Celebrate Recovery group through attending meetings as well as taking service positions, getting into the team positions of the you know, meeting leadership, you know, the TEAM, teachers, encouragers, assimilators. You're all capable and able to be of service and your recovery will benefit from it. God bless you. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to share what God is doing in me. Thank you, Jeff. Extremely powerful, don't you think? <clears throat> I mean, there's a lot there. <laughs> There's plenty of stuff that we can all benefit from. And I know God has been speaking through you, Jeff, to each one of us tonight. Thank you very much for coming. Really appreciate it very much. Uh, who's supposed to do the serenity prayer? Am I? Oh. <laughs> well, I'm really on top of things tonight, aren't I? <laughs> all right, let's all stand and pray the serenity prayer. God... Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be ha reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. Well, thank you very much. You may now go to your groups.